Good morning, everyone. I'm sorry for the late start. I think that um, this is certainly the first day of winter. We all enjoyed a 70 degree Thanksgiving, which is a little bit odd. And I know I was shocked a bit when I woke up this morning, but I'm glad it's not sleeting at least. Um, a warm welcome to our Chinese guests who will come in and, and others. I'm Deborah Gordon. I'm the director of the Carnegie Energy and Climate Program. And a bit of background. When our program decided to host a China Oil Forum, we were struck by how few policy events in D.C. and Beijing fo focused just on oil. You know, even we were, as we were planning this, kept on getting pulled into energy as a large issue, certainly gas, and if not because of China, coal. And all of a sudden, you're not really talking about oil any longer. You're talking about everything energy and, and real questions of oil get lost. So we wanted to stick to our original intent, which we luckily were able to, and put together a day of all different angles, much of which is focused on geopolitics and environment on energy, but can go into all different directions on oil. Why only oil? I mean, maybe you already know because you're here, which is, which is fantastic. But there certainly has been a paradigm shift in North America um, where we had previously previous inaccessible oil resources. I mean, the shale oil has been there all along. I started my career at Chevron, and the concept of fracking was always there. It just wasn't really um, economic to go into these very deep fissures and get the oil. But the technology, the high prices and technology turned on, and a lot of demand was the reason for this, the demand largely in China and to a certain extent also in Asia that turned this oil market and has transformed it in many ways and ironically is also now transforming these low prices as China is the marginal producer, I mean the marginal consumer using less oil. Now we're seeing the price of oil plummet in the face of surplus supply. So China's a huge factor looking ahead in the oil space. Um, China also has its own oil resources which are due to probably be exploited, but with a lot of issues. There's a map that, that you got in the handout that we were able to put together using a lot of um, Chinese sources that show all the different oils that are in China, and there is a lot of watching globally of what's going on in terms of exploiting unconventional oils, because China has those as well, and we'll, and we'll end up going there. Why... Um, you know, the, there, there are many other issues that I can mention that you know very well in terms of few substitutes for oil. So it keeps oil in the market, which means that the U.S. and China are going to have to deal with this issue that's massively capitalized, not enough information often. No one really can answer what's going on with the oil price right now, when it might turn again. And in terms of China oil, um, China is facing very difficult oil choices. They're surfacing with the recent crackdown the state-owned enterprises in terms of oil companies, forays into struggling nations. I mean, certainly how China will go into Africa or is going into Africa, what will happen between China and Venezuela. There are a lot of questions about its going out strategy as that will continue, and certainly debates about how it will develop its own resources in the face of mounting air pollution, um, agreements right now with the U.S. on climate change. So this imbalance between China's consumption and China's potential production or desire or need for the supply creates a real conundrum for China. If it does, if the economy turns around, China's looking at ultimately about a four to one factor between the difference in its consumption and its production. So there might be four times the consumption than there is the production of oil at home. And that's just a huge differential that China's going to have to navigate. So I'll stop there. Um, we've prepared the background here, which you have. So you have some maps and some graphs with, 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 um, with some background information. Um, just so you know, we're going to be tweeting. So feel free, um, China Oil, hashtag China Oil, at Carnegie and Dow, hashtag China Oil. If you'd like to tweet anything you hear, go for it. That would be, that would be absolutely fine. And I'm going to turn it over to my um, Xinhua University colleague, Matt, 
to come to come in and um, kick off the first panel, which is the global oil paradigm shift that I first briefly to spoke about, and have a discussion um, between a Chinese scholar and a Chinese uh, counterpart, and have a conversation on what this oil paradigm shift means to cooperation between the U.S. and China. So enjoy the day. We are going to open up to a lot of discussions, so think about questions as you're going and be prepared to engage. Thank you so much. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, looks like we still have a few people that might be coming in over the course of the morning, but we'll go ahead and, and get started. Um, my name is Matt Furchin. I am a resident scholar at the Carnegie Tsinghua Center uh, in Beijing, uh, and I'm also a faculty member at Tsinghua University in the International Relations Department. Um, and in a second, I will go ahead and, and introduce um, the panelists um, that are going to be discussing um, the issues related to the global paradigm shift uh, and U.S.-China relations with us this morning. Um, I just wanted to make a couple of quick follow-up comments to those that, that Debbie made, uh, and then I'll go ahead and, and introduce our, our panelists. Um, this may not need saying, but um, I found the idea that this is such a timely issue to be worth saying something about. Um, just yesterday, as I went to the airport and picked up a newspaper, uh, one of the main Chinese newspapers, the front page story had a headline about global oil and a picture of a sort of, uh, of, of, the, of, the, of the globe and then a, a chessboard on top of it. And the whole topic was about OPEC and global chess match and then inside articles about OPEC oil price negotiations and including an article about Venezuela, which I'll, I'll talk a little bit about later. But clearly, dropping oil prices in the news matters in China, and obviously China's role in that is very important. Um, and then just a few weeks ago, after the APEC meetings in Beijing, the announcement about U.S. and China cooperation on global climate change, and clearly a major part of that involving um, energy and, 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 and oil as well as other things. So um, in a sense, it goes without saying how this is important and, and in the news, um, but it's also, I think, just a, a great timing for us to have this discussion. And to start us off this morning, uh, we have two great speakers who are going to discuss the, the broad issues and will sort of set the tone for the day. So um, let me just do some brief introductions, and then we'll get into it. Um, so the first of our panelists is Xu Qinghua, uh, who is a professor in the, international, in the School of International Studies at Renmin University, or People's University, in Beijing, uh, where she is also the director of the university's Center for International Energy and Environment Strategy Studies, uh, and has extensive international study uh, and work experience, but as far as I understand, this is her first trip to Washington, D.C., so welcome, Professor Xu. Um, and then our second panelist uh, is Michael Herberg, uh, who is the research director of the National Bureau of, Asia's, of Asia Research's Energy Security Program. Uh, he's also a senior lecturer on international and Asian security at the Graduate School of International Relations and Pacific Studies at the University of California. San Diego. So with that, um, I will go ahead and hand the floor over uh, to Professor Xu, uh, who will give us uh, around a 15-minute presentation. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So thanks for the invitation. Um, I'm happy that to be given the chance to be discussing something about the China's reaction under the new coming oil order. So when I'm preparing for my um, speech, so I'm raising some questions for myself. The first is, what sort of impact of the oil paradigm shifting for Chinese energy industry development? Um, and what the relationship between 
the oil paradigm shifting with the China energy revolution, which was raised by Xi Jinping in the beginning of 2014. And uh, we have already passed one year, the whole 2014. So what happened to China that um, what has been progressing under the energy revolution uh, based on the energy uh, revolution policy because Chinese government is top down, as you see. So I try to use a case study uh, using an energy sort, um, natural gas, to be analyzed. What we have been doing uh, in the production and also consumption and also in the reforming of the mechanism and also in the international cooperation because uh, everybody here is very clear that China has been progressing very aggressively this year in cooperating with Russia. And also, we have the climate agreement with the US. So we, our foreign policy has been trying to strike in a balance between the Russia and the US, I think, because I'm not leading the Center of International Energy and Environment Strategy um, studies, and I'm also leading an institute of Russia, Eastern Europe, and Central Asia of my university. So the third question I raised for myself is, what is the key thing that has been pivoting China's foreign energy policy? So what is the real thing we can be forecast in the future that China will be more closer to which country or which group or which, I think, the oil order. So I think just as our Xi Jinping has just give a speech about the China's foreign policy, he gave a new thinking that Chinese is, has been involved in not only in the country competition, but also in the, um, how to say, to which place we are trying to be sit, sit in. So if you look at his speech. So let us look at in detail the natural gas. First, the demand and the consumption side. We know that this year that there is a very slowdown in energy consumption growth rate in China. So there is a saying that China might be also an energy consumption camping. Capping, I mean, <coughs> there might be some energy peak, consumption peak. But the growth rate of, though the growth rate of oil, coke, electricity, and other energy products has been decreased to single digit growth, but natural gas, consumption grew double digit at 13.9%, amounting to 167.3 billion cubic meters. Natural gas imports grew by 25% and 53 billion cubic meters, of which 17 million tons are LNG imports. And dependence of foreign supply was 31.6%. The fact is China, for the first time, import, I mean the net import, the natural gas since 2007. That means we, we firstly import natural gas in 2006. So 2007, I called as the natural gas policy year that we issued so many natural gas promoting the policy at that year. So China has become the third largest consumer of natural gas in the world but it is only 5.8 of the Chinese energy consumption mix. When, if we compare it to the average 24% of the developed countries, we think that there exists a large capacity for growth. That is the demand side. For the supply side, so when we have been expanding our um, production and the supply, capacity, 
we expanded natural gas production capacity with the construction of the west to east pipeline, trying to deliver natural gas from the western to the eastern region. So, through international cooperation with Central Asian countries, there we have three pipelines already. A, B, C have been built, and this summer I joined the, how to say, the approval of the pipeline D, so also from Turkmenistan and natural gas resources to China, has already begun. So agreements has been signed with Turkmenistan for the supply of 68 billion cubic meters of natural gas. And we also signed an agreement to Russia for the supply of 68, the same data, the figure, billion cubic meters of natural gas through the eastern and western pipelines. And the coastal provinces have also increased their imports of liquefied natural gas, LNG, from abroad. So to easing that our supply cannot meet the demand. But the thing, the question is, so many people visit my center, give my question is, why China signed so many agreements with Russia? Because China are thirsty for the natural gas and thirsty for the overseas energy source. And my answer is no. I said that the Russia is dependent on China's market, energy market. Why? That is what we have been doing in the natural gas sector reform. The reform for what? The reform for the price. Because China, the natural gas pricing mechanism is from the planned economy. And right now we have two kinds of pricing mechanism. For the old well natural gas, natural gas well, we have the well gas price. It's very low. It's cheap compared the new natural gas well. So we still, the government still control very much the price of the natural gas. Why? So we need to have a close look at the natural gas consumption according to its use. That in China, city gas has the highest share of natural gas consumption at 41%. Um, so citizenry, citizenry sees natural gas supply as a social and a public welfare. So it should have a public utility nature. The government should be given the financial subsidy and the government should try to keep the balance that to induce the market price market mechanism to the planned mechanism to be protecting and keeping the stability of social life of the citizens. So that is one thing that because the pricing control the mechanism, the energy consumption market can be expensive very quickly. So now the total agreement for importing the natural gas in the following 10 years has already reached what we need in the downstream. And another thing is that at current prices of natural gas, we compared with coal, to use natural gas for electricity generation, the cost in terms of per kilowatt hour is double that of using coal in China. Thus, it is difficult to use natural gas except under the circumstance of coping with peak demand for electricity. So that means that we cannot find a huge market in the electricity, the power generation for the use of natural gas. And also that we find it difficult that the natural gas to lots of extent can be replacing the coal, the roll within the dozen of years in China. So what the reform has been doing now? There is some reform, just as our president, she said, the China energy re revolution 
is there are five points. The first is the revolution in production. The second revolution in consumption. The third is revolution in mechanism. The fourth is the revolution in the technology. The last one is a revolution or expansion of international cooperation. So the key point of the revolution, I think, is the system, the mechanism. So how to do it? What we have been doing in the natural gas sector? So Chinese government has been trying to liberalizing the upstream production of natural gas. That means to introduce and invite more and more various ownership, the producers into the upstream. And also to try to free the consumption market in the downstream that to invite more and more competitors into the buying market, that is. But we still have one thing under the control, just as we just we, 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 we did our power the reform that we control the, the midstream. That means the transportation. So why the states try to control the main distribution system for natural gas by the regulation of the midstream pipeline system. And it has become the most challenge for the China energy industry reforming. I think because that, that is the benefits negotiation among the government and the beneficials. I mean, the, lots of the monopoly, the companies. So that means that China's energy reforming and energy revolution has been facing extraordinary, fiercely resistance from inside the country and also the companies. So recently, short-term international oil prices has been suffering decline, falling as much as 25%. So in Asia, we all know that prices of oil and the natural gas are interlinked, which means the natural gas prices will fall as well. So falling oil prices will also affect the coal chemical products industry, narrowing its competitive advantage in pricing, inhibiting its development. But this brings a good chance and opportunity for China to try to improving and to try to, trying to um, improving its energy mix. That means um, that under such circumstances and, and oil paradigm shifting, that China can buy much cheaper energy, including oil and natural gas, that can remain in some uh, financial funding on capitals to be um, reorganizing its energy industry. That is the right opportunities. So China has, okay, let me finish. China has, because China is lots of things, so <laughs> I, want, I want to be reporting to everyone here. It's not easy for me to fly in over so long time here. China, so give me five minutes extra. China has so many committed to the international community that this portion of proportion of non fossil energy in the energy mix will be 11.4% in 2015, and the 15% come 22, and the 20% come 23. I think it's an ambitious target. So why we released the signal for the, the international community, and why we finally agreed to admit there is the climate change and also have the agreement with the uh, US, I think, because uh, we, we, we find that that's the right thing that's using the committed to the international community to, to push the internal, the country, the national reforming and the revolution for our energy mix. So my answer to the, my, the third question is, what is the key thing that private in the China foreign energy policy is the energy mix. So in our analyzing that China's energy mix 
will not absolutely change for the following 20 years. That means even 2030, the coal will be occupying totally more than 50% of the energy mix. Okay, so we still can be dependent on China's coal production because China's the number one energy producer thanks for the coal and also the number one energy consumption and also the number one emission of course and also the number one oil importer from outside. So because we are dependent more on coal, so our total energy foreign dependence rate is under 12% totally. So what does it mean that China has the freedom to be deciding its foreign energy policy because of coal? And the second is because China is oil, the number one import country, and we have more and more increase of the natural gas consumption, then China should be following the traditional oil order. Okay? So China also feel and try to keep the pace with the United States. Their the mapping into the new energy era. So that China always should also keep the balance to be following the US. So you could find, find that this year, China's foreign policy is trying to keep the balance between the Russia and also the, the US. We, we get agreement both with the Russia and both with the US. Also, we have so many contracts during our premier and president's visit to Europe. So my conclusion is China's energy revolution in the area of the international oil production and consumption um, change and the shift. Our revolution is a very, very ambitious and tough task. It will be lasting a long time. And China's foreign energy policy will be trying to keep balance among various groups and China even following the old groups and old energy system, but China try to be emerging at some country to some extent to have some power in deciding something, especially in the pricing, international pricing mechanism. Okay, I'm finished, Great. and I'm sorry. No, it's terrific, thank you. Um, and and uh, I completely agree, <laughs> flying halfway across the world, you wanna be able to say the key things you wanna say, so very valuable. Thank you very much. Um, you know, we'll have a chance to talk more about this in a minute. I find it very interesting, the framing of what is going on in, in China as, a, as an energy revolution. It's a, maybe, you know, the, again, the ambition of it, but also the way in which that's being linked to foreign policy um, efforts and, and how that can be thought about here in, in Washington, D.C., I think is very important. So thank you very much. Um, and we'll move over to Michael. Thanks, Matt. Um, and I want to thank Carnegie and Debbie for uh, bringing me here to speak to this group, uh, distinguished group today. Um, in trying to think about China's global oil impact, I think it's, it's important to appreciate the scale of the, uh, of the impact, the, the enormous gravitational force uh, that China has on global energy markets and its oil, its decisions about coal use, become an enormous force in natural gas markets in Asia and globally. You know, go across the energy spectrum and China is literally a dominating a demand force across virtually all these, uh, these various uh, fuels. To me, the big, the big question is coal, but we're here to talk about oil today, so I'll, I'll talk about oil. Um, if we drill down into oil and China's kind of oil impact uh, globally, you know, demand has quadrupled 1990 to 2010, oil demand in China. Uh, they've gone from 2.5 million barrels a day to 10 million barrels a day consumption. 
Now, six million barrels a day of that is imported. They're the largest net oil importers that we mentioned before, surpassing the U.S. They're the largest buyer of crude oil from uh, Iraq, often Saudi Arabia, uh, Iran. So, you know, when you, when you look out at the effect of this enormous demand growth and import consumption growth, uh, China has become this huge uh, force. Forty percent of the increase in global oil consumption over the last two decades has come out of China. Uh, so you can kind of go through all the, all the magnitudes of the impact they're having on the market. But I think from a, and if you go forward, you know, the IEJ just came out with a recent uh, forecast. The world, the, the IEA has come out with a forecast. China is likely to be heading for 16 million barrels a day of oil consumption uh, in the next 15 or 20 years. 10 million of which plus will be imported. Uh, so it's true that, 12 per, that China only imports 12 or 13 percent of its energy supplies when you take into account coal and the others. But in this particular uh, area of oil, which is a, you know, a very different, very peculiar, very unique part of the energy mix, uh, China is facing this enormous dependence on imported crude uh, that's, that's almost certainly going to grow when we talk about uh, uh, low oil prices and what that might mean. What that has driven is this enormous push by the leadership with their national oil companies and energy diplomacy uh, to try to capture oil supplies for China around the world. Uh, China Energy Incorporated, I, I, I call it. And, you know, this conversion of energy diplomacy by Beijing, the companies, all these things that help uh, China's national oil companies acquire fields, get contracts, uh, get better relationships with the key producing countries. Uh, and all the, the supply contracts, the investments, the people on the ground that they're putting out around the world, uh, all the key energy exporting regions, the Middle East, Africa, Central Asia, uh, Latin America, and uh, even to North America. You know, China has, become, has gained this amount of influence, this potential for influence uh, as a key f factor in a lot of these energy exporting regions. Uh, this has brought both the advantage of potential influence in key places around the world, securing those supplies of oil, but I think it's also complicated China's life diplomatically because it's drawn them into all kinds of complicated relationships and complicated and violent places where they have sent their companies and their people to try to uh, try to supply that oil. A good example would be Sudan. The last thing China wants to do is be drawn into the domestic politics of a place like Sudan and South Sudan. Uh, its policy of non-intervention in, in countries' internal affairs is a serious policy. It's been a consistent policy. Uh, but then it runs up against the fact that CNPC, its largest uh, overseas oil production position, is in Sudan, and it's being damaged and production has been cut by the the uh, war between South Sudan and Sudan. And now China has been working very hard to become a mediator, to help mediate some sort of an agreement between the two countries. Uh, and this is a new development in the sense in China's involvement in these places, that it's being pulled into playing a role in places that it really would just like to access the oil supplies, do business, and not get pulled into these broader diplomatic uh, problems in the area. Uh, Iran is another case where they have to do this delicate dance between acquiring, you know, buying oil from Iran as one of its largest overseas suppliers, but trying to make sure that its purchases don't poison its relationship with the U.S. and, and really push too hard on the U.S. Uh, uh, you know, oil sanctions on Iran. So you could go through a number of these countries where that search for oil supplies, quest for energy security, is drawing them into places that they don't want to be drawn into, but they're being pulled into these uh, difficult situations. And in many places, this is bump, bumping right up against U.S. involvement, U.S. vital interests. Uh, so you see China and the U.S. in these key energy exporting regions bumping up against one another uh, pretty regularly now. And I think from the U.S.-China perspective, this raises that whole set of issues about can the U.S. and China find common ground on strategic and foreign policy issues in some of these key places. Uh, if, if you kind of go around what I think are the key 
key places here. Obviously, the Middle East is first on the list. Uh, China de depends on the Middle East for half of its oil imports. That means it's 30 percent of its entire <coughs> oil consumption. It obviously has vital interests in Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Iran, all these places. Uh, the U.S. has been traditionally the dominant player, of course, in the region. Uh, and as China's influence, as its role, as its presence grows in the Middle East, in the Gulf particularly, the question becomes, can the U.S. and China work together? You know, the U.S. has been the one out there spending blood and treasure trying to stabilize the region, keep the sea lanes open for the last 40 or 50 years. Uh, China's approach has been to do business with the region, access the oil supplies, uh, but not get drawn into any broader role. It sees its energy security interests in fairly narrow national terms of acquiring our oil supplies, uh, for China's oil supplies. Uh, the U.S. approach has been to keep the sea lanes open, try to stabilize the region because we're seeking broader market stability. Uh, we're not trying to make sure our companies can access Persian Gulf oil. What we're trying to do is stabilize the global market, make sure that oil flows because it's the linchpin uh, to world supplies and oil prices. So I think a really key question in the U.S.-China energy relationship is can the U.S. and China begin to find common ground on how to try to find ways to stabilize uh, the Middle East and the Persian Gulf, try to keep the sea, make sure the sea lanes are open and secure all the way from Asia uh, to the Persian Gulf. Both China and the U.S. and Chinese leaders have said, you know, we have a vital interest in stability in the Middle East. The U.S. obviously has a vital interest. The global economy has a vital interest. The real problem or the question is that we, China and the U.S., see how to achieve stability in the Middle East in very different ways. So even though we have a common interest, uh, our approach to Iran, China doesn't agree with our approach to Iran. China didn't agree with our approach to Iraq in 2003 and back in 1990. Uh, so when you go through a litany of issues related to uh, what it takes to try to stabilize the region, the U.S. and China have very different visions of what that involves. Uh, I, we had a meeting in uh, Beijing a couple months ago, a workshop, and I said to a Chinese counterpart that the U.S. You know, US feels that China is free riding on these efforts by the U.S. to stabilize the region. China has to play a bigger role. And I, he, got, he got very incensed and said, well, if we're not free riding. We're being taken for a ride by the U.S. because of the Iraq war, the Iran sanctions, all these other things. It may be a, a free ride, but the driver's crazy. <laughs> you know, he said it's a real issue whether the driver knows what he's doing, whether he's crazy or whether he's a good driver. So the perception of how you achieve stability in the region is, is very different in Beijing. But we each know that stability in the region is, is critical. So I think that's, that's where this issue really is joined between the U.S. and China on a strategic level, whether we can find some common ground. Uh, I think it related to that is China's strategy for national oil company expansion. You know, this China Energy Inc. and the kind of this very narrow uh, search for China's own oil supplies and supply lines and, and, and sea lanes, and this U.S. approach to the market. I think a key question is whether China will begin to think about their energy security as a market stability issue and global supply issue. Uh, rather than a narrow search for their particular oil supplies uh, to meet their needs. And so that, that, to me, is another key element of whether there's a transition in the leadership's perception of what really drives their energy security, whether it's a global market issue or China seeking uh, its narrow uh, uh, supplies of oil. Uh, one final issue I, I just point to on the oil side you know, because this gravitational force of China is so large in the energy side, decisions that China makes about energy, decisions in Beijing, don't stay in Beijing. They have global implications, and this is particularly true in oil. So one of the critical elements is China's approach to motorization uh, and the vehicle uh, growth 
because that increasingly is going to drive oil demand growth, both globally and for China. If you go from 10 million barrels a day to 16 million barrels a day over the next 20 years, most of that is going to be for this massive expected increase in the vehicle fleet, going from 100 million vehicles to 350 million vehicles over the next 25 years. Uh, so f from a global perspective, decisions China makes about motorization, vehicles, uh, oil use, are going to be critical to the oil market and the energy security of, of uh, all, every, everybody who imports oil. And um, a key element to this, and I think a wild card in the oil outlook, is air pollution. Increasingly, about a third now of, of uh, say, Beijing's air pollution is coming out of tailpipes, not from coal-fired power plants. And that, that share is going to increase dramatically over the next 20 years. Uh, and this is a key forcing issue, the air quality issue, the air pollution issue, uh, that could drive China to do things on the oil consumption side, which bring down that demand curve pretty <coughs> dramatically. I think this is one of the real key uncertainties in the global oil outlook, uh, this trajectory of Chinese oil consumption. And it's going to be driven by China's decisions about vehicles, motorization, uh, transportation uh, in China. You could imagine a three or four million barrel a day swing in the outlook for oil consumption if China does some much more aggressive things in bringing down that vehicle and oil, oil consumption curve. So those are just, I think, a few of the issues. Uh, there's plenty of other things to, to talk about. But I think, in my mind, those are some of the key elements of China's kind of impact on global oil markets and, and, and what's coming. So I'll leave it at that. Matt, Great. Thanks. Questions. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, again, thanks to both of you. Um, Michael, that reminds me, you know, I've now been working on China energy and its overseas um, foreign policy as it relates to energy for the last few years. And your work and discussions with you originally when I first, first started looking at this was inspirational and continues to be. And uh, a lot of the things that I still think about today are very much related to, to issues that you just brought up. So it's great to hear that. Um, I'm going to open it up to uh, questions here in just a minute. Before I do that, I'd like to take the opportunity um, to ask both of you one issue that's related to both of your expertise and issues that you, you both just mentioned. So China, under Xi Jinping, has a new major initiative, um, which I think has important implications for energy and energy security and its relations with um, other countries, both near and further away, um, and touches on questions of, of stability. And this is the new Silk Road initiative, which is both a overland and a maritime aspect to it. And I'm just wondering if I could get your thoughts um, on what you think of this initiative in the context of some of the issues that you brought up, what it will mean for China's approach to, to oil and, and how it plays into questions of energy security or even pricing issues. Any thoughts at all that you have on, on those? So, Mike, when we were in Beijing, then you discussed about China's free riding, and I support you that China is free riding. <laughs> that the thing is, how can China turn from the free riding to be the rider? I think so. That's the question. So I find that difference. That um, so, my friend Michael, he touched the issue is from how China's doing will be impact the whole globe, globe. That my touch the issue that how the globe change will be impacting the China issue. So I think that that is the difference between the vision. We are looking at the same thing from different uh, angle. That That is also the Chinese should be studying, learning from the US that we're trying to expanding our thinking in a more global way. So I think that that she is a very globalized person. And also Premier <coughs> Ke Chiang is also a globalized person. So you can find that before in Chinese governments that always the premiers the stand in front of the, the president. But now the premier is behind the president. That is the one change. The second is 
I think the China energy revolution is a signal that China has been changing its way and the role and the place in the, the global energy governance. That China tried to do something to be contributing to the world because they think that the energy security is the global issue. That it's there is no the depend, independent energy security in one country. It's the interdependence of it. If the world energy security is not good, I think China is not good either. So I think if China can save its oil importing from outside, then I think it's also beneficial to the whole world because the, the, the energy resources is floating mm -hmm. everywhere. So my final point is that mm, I just forgot. Maybe you first, then when I record, I will say. So thank you. <laughs> Well, you know, the, the, I, I've been thinking, looking at this maritime Silk Road notion. Um, and obviously, this raises all kinds of inter, inter, interesting questions about uh, uh, China's intentions for this notion. You know, from my perspective, China's impact, China's capacity, China's potential influence is going to grow, whether they like it or not, just to be driven by their interests in these expanding supplies and where they're going to have to come from. Uh, so the Maritime Silk Road, in a, in, a, in a benign interpretation, makes perfect sense because increasingly they're depending on that flow and the global market depends on uh, that Maritime Silk Road between the Middle East and Asia. You know, the, the whole fulcrum of global energy trade has shifted to this Gulf uh, Asia uh, oil trade. So in a benign interpretation of that, then you know, it makes perfect sense. And uh, you know, the US should not feel threatened by that. India should not necessarily feel threatened by that. Uh, makes, makes sense. But it all depends, of course, on your, your interpretation of China's future intentions, of what it's going to do with that increased presence and influence through this maritime uh, space. Uh, and that's why I was at, talking about the Middle East issue. How do we, can we find common ground? So I think the question for me would be, does China see this as a collaborative, global uh, effort that includes the U.S. and other key players that have vital interests in that flow and that space? Or does China see this as you know, a China increasingly... China dominated trade and oil trade route. So I think it's the, the China's capacity is going to grow to do these things. The question is how do we interpret that and how do we shape China's development of the maritime Silk Road or try to from the US perspective to shape it into something that is collaborative, that is uh, regional, that is non-threatening uh, for India and others. Uh, can I add, because I have a question. So I think maybe there is huge difference among the energy security understanding based on very different energy culture between the US and the China. Because China is a developing country and it, it has been challenged by the pollution and environment protection issue. So it has been turned from energy security, the definition from the IEA, the, self, the supply sufficiency, to be more like the three E's, economic development, environment protection, and energy, energy security. Because every, the three points, Chinese government should be, be very careful about it. If without green roads, the people will be rebelling. <laughs> so if Environment progression cannot be dealt with smartly, so people will be angry. So if the energy security can be... So I think Chinese government has been facing much tougher situation than the U.S. government. And now after Fukushima, the energy security has another content into it. It's the safety. That if China wants to change its energy mix more better, Maybe nuclear can be a lot of a good thing to be replacing lots of oil and as coal. But nuclear is relevant to the safety, the human being safety. 
So China should be very careful about it. So that is, I think, we are understanding the energy security issue, just as you said, from different vision and angle. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Um, so we have about 15 minutes now um, for a question and answer. If you could please uh, introduce yourself. We have, I believe, uh, microphones going off. You could just introduce yourself um, and then uh, ask your question as briefly as possible. Great. We'll start over here. Hi, I'm Bob Hormetz. I'm now Kissinger Associates. I was formerly Under Secretary of State for Economic Growth, Energy, and the Environment. So we spend a lot of time dealing with China on these very issues. I'd just like to make one historical reference and then a, uh, ask a question. The new Silk Road idea that Xi Jinping has talked about is very interesting because several years ago, we actually had put forward another vision of a new Silk Road. The desire at that point was to try to integrate Afghanistan and some of the Central Asian countries after America left, after American troops left Afghanistan to improve the prosperity of the region, to link Afghanistan more closely with other countries in the region. And every year during the World Bank IMF meetings, I would chair a meeting of finance ministers from the region, which included China, to talk about the new Silk Road. But the context was how do you link Afghanistan and other Central Asian countries together to enhance the prosperity of post-war Afghanistan and, 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 and also to broaden the number of countries involved. So we looked at it from a very different point of view. China, the question is, how does China look at it? And uh, ours was much more institutional in terms of strengthening the region. Does China look at it more in very narrow Chinese terms? And I think this is something that really requires a lot of thought and, and cooperation. It, it's true the two could mesh. It's also true the two visions could clash. But it's a very good point for further cooperation. But I just wanted to lay down that historical reference because I think it's, it illustrates that you can look at this in a very benign, harmonious way or as you point out, the opposite. The second is really a question, and that is, if you look at the notion of free rider that was talked about, the US has thought about this a lot, and that is, do we really, if we're talking about China patrolling the sea lanes and ensuring the security of the sea lanes, that sounds great um, in terms of, if you, if you really, think about it more deeply, however, the question arises, should we be careful what we wish for? Um, and that is, do American interests, do the interests of the Saudis, the Indians, the Indonesians, and many other countries, uh, are they served by a very extensive blue water Chinese Navy that goes all the way out into the Indian Ocean and beyond? Is that something, and into the Gulf? supplanting the Fifth Fleet or complementing the Fifth Fleet? These are really interesting questions. First of all, China is very reluctant to do it. Certainly at this point, they don't have the capacity to do it. And a lot of Chinese don't want to do it because of the intervention reasons that you mentioned earlier. From an American point of view, do we feel comfortable in China playing that role? Does, do the Indians feel comfortable? Do the Gulfies feel comfortable in, in, in having China play that role, what would it consist of? China did participate in the anti-piracy effort um, under e either an American admiral or British admiral, but they all worked together. That's an area where there was harmonious cooperation, but if China decides it wants to play a more extensive role, what does that mean for the US? What does it mean for all the countries along the, uh, the string of pearls and, and beyond that? These are questions that I think when we talk about free riders, we have to think very carefully about what that means, how that works, and under what circumstances it would be good, and under what circumstances it would cause a lot of concern for the U.S. and other countries in the region. This is a tricky issue, and slogans like free rider, non-free rider, just skim the surface. It's a very deep issue, and it has profound security and economic and political implications. Thanks. Thoughts from either of you? Yeah, I, you know, I, 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 I couldn't agree more. I, I, I think the way I tend to think about it is that China will have a blue water navy. It will be there. Right. Yeah. And so the, it's not a question of whether they will or won't, although certain things the U.S. does 
could shape that more or less, you know. Uh, but uh, it seems to me virtually inevitable that they will. And so then you just you start asking the question, well, if that's going to happen, then how do we shape that? Is that going to be something we can shape in a collaborative way? Or is it a, going to be a competitive environment? And so I, that's the key issue to me, not whether they will, but when they do, how do we manage that? You know, and you have the, the, the piracy template, the piracy effort in the Gulf of Aden is a template for possible collaboration. Uh, and and we've, we had a workshop in Beijing. We talked a lot about that uh, in Tokyo as well. And so that, that's a potential template for collaboration. Uh, and so I don't think it's impossible, but I think, it, just as you said, it really depends a lot on, I think, U.S. diplomacy, Chinese diplomacy and perceptions. Uh, but I think they will be there. Yeah. And, and so the, then the question becomes, well, what does that mean? How do we shape that right. or try to shape it? Did you refer that initiative just called Istanbul Initiative, including the new Silk Road, the, the initiative, including Afghan and Central Asia and, and China that negotiates among all these countries? Did you refer that yes. that initiative? Okay. China, so, yeah. China has been for kings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they were, they were encouraged to come because they're a big trading partner with the whole region and more so as they grow. Yeah, yeah, because um, first, just because the, the envoy of Obama's Afghanians, the security that lady, he visited, she visited me, and and we had a dinner because we both China and and and, and the, the U.S. are worrying about the retreat troops after Afghanistan. But so in, interesting that you touched the two key points of China's foreign policy now. One is the new Silk Economic Belt at that initiative, and that. Another is the sea line is the China's the 21st maritime economic belt, <laughs> the, the, the road, I think. So I think just as uh, Michael said, that, that uh, Chinese has been doing something in, in the maritime the thing. But one thing I, I found is interesting that the conflicts happened in the, in the South, e, uh, South Sea and Eastern Sea is after the there is one thing the technology is the deep water. I think it's the offshore, the, the energy issue has become very hot point now after 2010. So because I'm always looking at the diplomacy based on the energy issues, I think because of the, the deep sh and the offshore the oil, appeared that the conflict has become more fearful. And also because the Asia-Pacific center has become emerging to be another consumer center of the whole world, energy consumer whole world, so that the competition in that region has become more and more fearful. That is, thank you. Thanks. Um, so we have just a little under 10 minutes. So what I'd like to do is collect um, uh, if we have up to three questions, um, we can collect those all at once and then have responses and try to wrap up this session um, by 1025. Um, hand over here. I'm Bill, Bill Brown. I'm an economist with Centra Technologies. My question is actually on the South China Sea, recent activity of deep, deep sea drilling. Um, but it relates to Dr. Xu, your really good point, I thought, about the domestic contention on the natural gas prices and how it really becomes a, all of this. In a decentralized economy, all of these become very argumentative, very controversial within your domestic economy. So my question is on the South China Sea. Um, you know, people will explore for oil all over the world. They really won't develop it in a contested area. I don't know anywhere where you spend the billions of dollars in a contested area. To, it's just too vulnerable. Um, oil is usually in areas you make agreements. So my, my question is for in uh, the South China Sea, do you find uh, domestic argumentation in China for some kind of solution there that would produce, that would get a consortium kind of production out of the South China Sea? Um, that would be, seem like it would be valuable to your consumers, obviously, but also to 
uh, industrial infrastructure producers. In other words, in a decentralized economy, you'd think there'd be a lot of people in China who would want to make development happen down there. Uh, rather than, in Washington here, we always treat it as a sovereignty issue, uh, which I'm, I'm wondering if it really should be a sovereignty issue or, a, or an economic issue. Thank you. Um, we have one in the back and then one up here, and I think we'll take those, those two and then we'll have responses. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm Qi Hang Zheng. Uh, I'm a reporter from Xinhua News Agency. Uh, my question is that now as the oil, uh, world oil prices go down and it may, some organization also expect it will last to the middle of next year. So my question is that as the world oil comes down, so how much it will impact the uh, renewable energies both in China and in U.S., because both countries' leaders have just made a joint commu- uh, commu- uh, com- uh, community to, boot, uh, to, boot, to cut their uh, carbon reduction, and also its impact on the U.S. Uh, shale gas. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, and then we'll take one more right up front here. Yeah, hi, Ken Mark or World Docs. Uh, speaking of global uh, oil paradigm shifts, one of the recent shifts is a shift from production by conventional means, meaning poke a hole in the ground, the oil comes out, to unconventional means like squeezing tar from sand and uh, fracturing the earth and drilling in deep water. Uh, has uh, China's oil production by conventional means peaked? And do you take into account in your planning uh, the fact that global oil production by conventional means has peaked? Great. Thank you very much. And for those of you who didn't get the, a chance to ask a question now, we still have the rest of the day, two more panels, um, and, then a, and then a concluding session. So hopefully you'll get a chance to, to make some comments. So let me throw it back to the, the two of you and um, for some brief comments so that we can move on to the, the next as well. Maybe uh, I shortly answer that. Your, your question is about the, the, the South Sea. That I, I think it's about the political and also economic Issue. As I know that maybe 10 years ago, our, our uh, some uh, officials of the Ministry of Land Source and also the uh, Ministry of Energy Administration, they suggested that our company, the minor three energy companies, to asking for that we have the share fields in the sea, in the, but our Ministry of Foreign Foreign Foreign. <laughs> Uh, affairs, they refuse. That they, they think that we don't want to bring up lots of conflicts in that area. So I think that because of the um, energy issues and resources and issues, and also you refer to sovereignty. I think that she think that it's 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 the last minute and the, the last space when China can be retreat or their people will. That their people will will be betrayed of, of of him. So I think it's about the political and also economic issues. And about that that question is, I, I just give the story about the. I think it's it's a good news for China, but it's not also both the good news and not not good news because for China, if China cannot take advantage of this the, the cheap oil price and try to be. Adjusting the energy mix, I think, um, if can manage to do it, it's a good news. But actually, that the main energy companies of China, they are trying to refusing to join in the new and renewable energy, the um, the investment. I think, for example, the Sinuk, you know, the Sinuk, the South Sea and OOC, they before they invest maybe five billion. Um, dollars to be in collaboration with another company under the SASAC of China. They tried to 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 have the try a pilot technology uh, re- reforming um, and invention in the new energy cars. But the, by the this in the beginning of this year, they gave up. They just sell the company out. Then they. Be involved, focused in the LNG. So I think if that is the bad news, 
And uh, referring to your question, I'm sorry, but I didn't very much catch off you. Maybe my friend again help, and please. Mm. Well, just a quick, the, the, in South China Sea, it's a matter of political will because you can do a joint development area like Thailand and Malaysia have done offshore. You can do a neutral zone like Saudi Arabia and Kuwait have done. This is easy to push the sovereignty issue down the road and say, let's develop the resource. But there's no political will in the region, we can talk about why, to kind of go that practical, practical route right now. In terms of the low oil price impact, this is an enormous near-term benefit for Asia, for China, bring down oil costs, but it's also bringing down LNG costs for Japan and South Korea across the region because these are oil-linked uh, LNG contracts. Huge benefits across the region from uh, both of those developments from, from lower-cost oil. But in a sense, for, for China, it's a mixed blessing because it might mean you know, lower oil prices probably mean higher oil consumption over time. You know, that's the natural relationship. And the, the, whole, the whole direction of policy, to me, would be to bring down that oil demand curve, uh, to, to slow down that oil import dependence growth. Uh, so I think it's a mixed blessing in a sense for China, lower costs, but also potentially pushing that demand curve up. And in terms of have we peaked in oil, the problem in the oil market today is too much oil. At $100 a barrel, we've got oil coming out of our ears from Bakken and everywhere else, uh, deep water development, all these things. So. Uh, our problem now is that at hundred dollars we got plenty of oil. It's a, it's a demand problem. Uh, so I, you know, I think the problem is, is too much oil at hundred bucks. Great. Well, thank you very much for both of you and for the great questions. Again, we're going to uh, have three more sessions uh, throughout the day. So I encourage you to stick around for more specific aspects of all of the issues that were. Um, so well brought up already in the discussion this morning. So thank you again to both of you and to all of you for coming.